Good morning, Fellowship Church. <clears throat> it is a good thing to be here for Sunday school. And while I do a little Father's Day opening and reading the scripture, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 23. The book of Acts chapter 23. <clears throat> And why do we come to Sunday school? It's to learn what God has to say in his word. And as we learn it and know it, we can apply it to our lives by faith. <clears throat> and I'm going to read this scripture for my prayer. It's from 1 Corinthians 8. It says, Now as touching things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. But love edifies. So knowledge without love are opposites. It doesn't do no good. And if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, which I hope is all of us, the same is known of him. Then it goes on that we don't be a stumbling block before our brethren. That's what we should be concerned with with our knowledge. <clears throat> Father's Day, a few words about this day is a challenge to fathers, to men, to husbands, for our parents that are fathers, is that we be men of God. And with the scriptures, how they say, to love, honor your parents until they die, whether they were good parents or evil parents, doesn't matter. The scripture for us that are saved, that truly know Christ as our Savior, is to honor our parents. And this Father's Day may be a... In our nation, we celebrate the nuclear family. One man, one woman, husband and wife. Although the, our nation is celebrating this whole month as Pride Month. Just the opposite of God's design. It shows where we are as a nation. But we aren't as individuals as a local church, as his people. We don't go with the flow, the stream of this world. This worldly system. God has called us out of it to his system. We have a kingdom that's not of this world. <clears throat> and a little humor to also wish Happy Father's Day to four fathers we probably met. We aren't sure if they're fathers or mothers, but one raccoon, one possum, one cat, one deer, maybe a small squirrel, and many birds. Those are what my wife feeds, and they came to our house, and we spotlighted them last night. So really, they don't understand none of this. They just know the food. But we're, we're called above animal instinct as children of God to know what's right and wrong, to discern, and to love God back with some of the love as much as possible to the love which he first loved us. Right? <clears throat> Let's go into... Chapter 23, I titled it Persecution, Protection, and Providence. The second slide, again, this is a book of transition. We're covering Paul's life to the end of chapter 28 and Rome, going to Rome. We're getting close to going to Rome. Third slide, <clears throat> a little perspective where we are. Paul has finished his three mission journeys. Now he's going to Caesarea and Jerusalem before he goes to Rome. And that's chapters... What's Paul doing in these chapters 21 to 26? He's given his testimony. What is your testimony? Let's look at Paul's. Being a, our testimony is different from being a witness. They're two different things that are very important to understand. What's the difference between our testimony and our witness. And we'll get into that because Paul covers it very well here. And he gives his testimony to five groups of people in these chapters. Acts 
21, 22, which Wayne finished uh, last Sunday, and 23, which we'll get today, covers a 12 days in Jerusalem. Paul's only there for 12 days to give a perspective of location and time. God has a time and timing in his plan and his will for his people. Paul is a great example, but we can learn to apply God's time and timing to our own lives. <clears throat> Each of these times, it starts with the angry mob. Anytime a mob comes to rule, it's of the divider, of the devil, of chaos. It's not law and order, which God is a God of order. So when you see that mob come, you don't respond as a mob. Which, How did Paul respond? With the word of God, with his testimony, in his position. <clears throat> and then we'll continue his testimony before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa the next three Sundays. And we'll see how the Roman soldiers were, uh, it was a nation, an empire of law and order at this time. And they were for the benefit of the gospel, not contrary to it. When a nation's doing right, it'll be for the benefit of the gospel. But when we do evil, it'll go against the gospel and deny it and neglect it and persecute it. We're going to be at uh, this fourth slide. And I'm going to read this through, chapter 23. Keep your Bibles open. And if you divide your Bible, it should be three parts. If you have headings of the sections, it should be three parts. I do this throughout the whole Bible. I've been working 30 years on the rightly dividing Bible. And this is the titles I give, which help me understand the content that follows. <clears throat> chapter 23 of Acts. Section 1 would be verses, really it starts in chapter 22, verse 30, because we're covering one day before the council and the reaction from the mob with the, the, the soldiers. So I'm going to start with 2230, and it's persecution of who? The religious people of his time, the high priests and the council. 22.30. On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty which he was accused of the Jews, who's he? The captain of the guard, the chief captain. He's over a thousand soldiers. He loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear. They came by commandment of the military. The Roman rule, the council which was in charge of Jerusalem, were really under Roman rule, and he commanded them to appear the next day. So they were there fully ready as the council, which is called Sanhedrin, the 70 that led the nation Israel like our Supreme Court. They were there. And he brought Paul down and set him before them, the council. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Verse 6 through 11 finishes it. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee of the hope and resurrection of the dead. 
I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have pulled in pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified to me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Part 2, verses 12 to 22. And I title this, A Vow, A Young Man, and a Soldier. Three key people involved here. <clears throat> and when it was day... Certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse, that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now, therefore, ye with the counsel signify to the chief captain that he bring down unto you tomorrow as though ye would inquire more perfectly concerning Paul. And we, or ever he came near, are ready to kill him. And when Paul's sister, son, heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him, and said, Bring this young man, Paul's sister's son, unto the chief captain, and he has, for he has certain thing to tell him. And the captain took the young man and brought him to the chief captain. Or the centurion took him, right? And said, Paul, the prisoner called me unto him, and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who has something to say unto thee, the captain. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him privately aside and asked him, What is this that thou hast to tell me? And the young man said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee that you would bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire of him more perfectly. But do <clears throat> not y thou yield to them, for they there lie in wait for him. They're laying in wait for Paul. Of them that more than 40 men which have bound themselves with an oath, that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, See that thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. Then, verse 23, And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen threescore and ten, and spearmen two hundred, at the third hour of the night. <clears throat> this begins section 3, verse 23, to the end of the chapter. It's the captain that's writing a letter to go with Paul to Caesarea. Verse 24, And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix, the governor. And he wrote a letter after this manner. Claudius Lysicia, unto the most excellent governor Felix, sendeth greeting. This man was taken of the Jews, and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. 
And when I would have known the cause thereof, they accused him. I brought him forth into their counsel, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bounds. <clears throat> and it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for the man. I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. Then the, <clears throat> they're going on the trip. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. On the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and returned to the castle, who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what providence he was. And when he understood that he was of Cilicia, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. <clears throat> so all this is happening, his second testimony in a three-day period. Let's go back and look at some details within chapter 23. And if you read ahead, or this may help you understand, because there's no reason to teach the word or to hear it unless you're learning something. And it's really the teacher's responsibility, if God's called them to teach, to search out the scriptures, to put time into it, because it blesses the teacher even more than the student, the learner. And I thank God for Wayne, for Phil, for Justin. And there's one more. Who am I forgetting? Phil, Wayne, Justin. Raymond. Raymond, yeah, for next Sunday. He'll be in there. He has next Sunday for Sunday school. Right. As we take turns, and I know all these men prepare well throughout the week to, to understand themselves, ourselves, because we must understand before we teach others. If you're in... And I have loved these brethren in the Lord and their love for the Lord and for his word. So, beginning with chapter 23. And Paul earnestly beholding the council. That beholding is the same word for when Jesus went up to heaven in Acts chapter 1 and they were beholding him going up into the clouds. Focused. This was a time in his life he knew this was very important. He was totally there. Now, are we totally where we're supposed to be when we're there? Paul was there, and he's always been there. Um, from his first missionary journey to the third, Paul didn't, he seeked the Lord. He was, had his time to grow in Christ, and he knew what the Lord's will was. He, lear he learned how to follow the Holy Spirit, not himself. So he addresses it to the council looking at them in a steadfast way. The council is the Sanhedrin. There are 70 that began in the time of Moses when he couldn't judge all by himself the nation in the wilderness. And he said, select 70 men to judge Israel to help you. So that became the, the rule. The 70 elders were selected from the Pharisees and Sadducees over Jerusalem, yes, the capital, but they had also little Sanhedrins what were set up in the different cities and villages. The different number, a little different system, but they were acted as judges. Even where Jesus grew up, the city of Nazareth, the village of Nazareth, 400, 500 people would have some sort of form of the Sanhedrin in their village of the elders. And he says, men and brethren. He doesn't start out men, brethren, and fathers. There's a reason. In chapter 22, men, brethren, and fathers, when he's speaking to everyone, the mob, the people. Here he's speaking just before the council themselves, the leaders, religious leaders of his time in the, nation, in the capital, Jerusalem, because he himself is an elder. He, would, he knew that council, that Sanhedrin, very well because back in his old life, he gave his testimony last week, 22, he went and 
and serve that council, persecuting, putting in jail, even killing the Christians. So he knew them very well. So he doesn't have to say elders. He's one of them. And he's speaking right to them. I have lived in a good conscience before God until this day. A good conscience is good, but before God, not before man. Before God first, our conscience must be good. And then before man. Because if it's good before God, our conscience, what we're thinking and going through our emotions will be good before man also. And until this day, Paul knew he could fall. He says, I buffet my body lest I myself am a castaway. Um, and he knew that he could fall, but he didn't. He fought the good fight of faith until the end, 2 Timothy tells us. <clears throat> so he, until that, this day, and the high priest, Ananias, Ananias was selected as a high priest, King Herod Agrippa II, about 10 years earlier. He knew King Agrippa was the high priest. But we'll get into this. He was a wicked and cruel high priest also, where later on he's going to be this mob that attacked Paul. They're going to attack him later and kill him. About 66 AD, the second Jewish revolt is the anti-Roman Jews in Jerusalem attacked him and killed him later, a little part of history. So it came back upon him. What you sow, you reap, whether it be good or evil. He commanded that by him to smite him on the mouth. All right. Did he actually smite Paul? I don't believe so. But who else got smote on the mouth by command of the high priest? Jesus when he went to his trials after his, he was in the upper room his, his, uh, <clears throat> before he was crucified, he was smitten and hidden. Why wasn't Paul? Which I, he wasn't because Paul automatically said, as he defended himself when they were ready to kill him with the mob, he says, I'm a Roman. It wasn't Paul's time. He knew it wasn't his time. So he defended himself. And he's defending himself again here. Then Paul said to him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. Same as Jesus said. He called the religious people, the Pharisees, and, and uh, especially the Pharisees and Sadducees, whited walls. What's a whited wall? They wanted to make sure when they came to the festivals, the, the, all the people in the Passover and different ones, that they wouldn't touch a tombstone. And they would make them white so they were conspicuous because they couldn't, they were polluted or made dirty by touching a dead person or a tomb or anything that was done with it. So they whited them during these festivals so the outward would be white, but still it stayed the same inside. So he's calling them the second time, the same as Jesus did, whited wall. For thou sittest to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. And they stood by. Why do you revile the high, God's high priest? Then said Paul, I didn't know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of the people. Quoting Exodus, Paul knew the scriptures well, better than the Pharisees, better than the religious people, because he didn't have all the extra things that they added. He just had the law itself, the bare words, without their interpretations and additional um, things which dilute the pure law. And why was this? As Wayne pointed out last week, Paul couldn't see the high priest. His vision was very poor. To me, that's obvious, all the evidence that he, his thing that he said three times, Lord, heal me. But Jesus replied, my grace is sufficient for thee. Very clear. We don't have to wonder about other things or could have been this or that. Let's just look at what the weight of the scripture point toward. That's rightly dividing the word of God. Then verses 6 to 11. I'll bring out a few things here. Let's see. Verses 6 to 9. He got the Pharisees. The first thing that he got them, he perceived that 
One part were Pharisees, one part Sadducees. You could say this is one part is, is this denomination and one is this denomination. Two groups that believe in the word of God, but differently. And how we believe and interpret the word of God is important. The doctrines of it is what guides our lives. We can be strengthened or we can be weakened. And the Pharisees were more close than the Sadducees. And they believed in the resurrection. Why wouldn't the Sadducees believe in the resurrection? Well, one thing, if you don't believe there's a life after this life, you can do whatever you want and still believe in the law. You mix. You mix, hey, I'm, I'm a religious person, but I can do whatever I want. We all die and nothing happens after it. We're all going to the same place. That is not true. The Pharisees knew that. They were closer to the truth. Many of the Pharisees came to know Jesus later or at different times. So with these two groups, and then there's two other things besides the resurrection, which is the most important. Verse 8, For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. But the Pharisees confess both. So also they didn't believe in any angels, any spiritual type of activity that we cannot see. They believe what I see is what I believe, not the invisible, what we don't see, which is by faith also. And he repeats it in verse 9, for there arose a great cry. He's causing division. And the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, we find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. <clears throat> I'm also doing a study on Wednesday nights on the angels. So this key I took, what, why does he put angels with spirit? Angels is spe or spirit. There's a reason. And it brought me to uh, really the Psalms. And I have a handout later. The Psalms speak of angels 11 times. And the 10th time, it's in Psalm 104, verse 4, where he says, the psalmist, God makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. His angels spirits. And that goes along with, is an angel a spirit? Yes. Or angels are spirit, they're equivalent. But you know, some versions of the Bible, really most of them, the modern ones, they put, makes his angels winds. There's a difference between winds and angels. So if you're using a version that has winds, that's an inferior version. And I go down to the word, the, the details of the word at times, as I go through every word in Greek or Hebrew and preparing for the study, as, as others do too, um, over 90% of the time when there is a difference, I find the King James wording is superior, is stronger, is more clear. So this is one of those cases where it should be spirits, his ministers. And they, they combine them, the Pharisees, understanding there is a spiritual world. Winds is related as a subcategory under spirits. But the spirits of, with the angels are things that are under God's control. Remember when David was going to battle and he said, uh, when should I go to battle? And, and the Lord spoke to him and he said, when you see the air moving above the mulberry trees, twice. That, that's God's spirit preparing the way. Then he knew it was time to go to battle and war. The spirit leads us and moves us today that lives within us. In many other instances, but let's continue. Let's look at the, the vow, the young man, and the soldier, verses 12 to 22. Well, we didn't finish verse 10. Let's see. Yeah, okay. The chief captain, which I said before, he was over 10 centurions. The centurion, over 100 soldiers. The chief captain was over 10 groups of 100 or 1,000. So he was like a, a captain in the military today or, or a commander. And what did he do? Fearing lest Paul should have pulled him in pieces of them, 
commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force. That word, take him by force, is the same in Greek, harpazo, forcibly taken. That's the same as the rapture, is another word for it. The church, we that are the true church, will be raptured, forcibly taken up in the twinkling of an eye before Christ returns. Interesting, same word. It's used 13 times, and each time implies the same thing in the New Testament. Forcibly taken out, and quickly, in the twinkling of an eye, to bring him into the castle. Verse 11, I'm going to finish there, is the last time Jesus Christ speaks in the New Testament directly in the inspired scriptures. So let's look at what it says. And the night following, the Lord stood by him. Not the first night he was in, uh, uh, captive by, in the castle, but the second night. Be of good cheer. The angel, the Lord, same as the angels, Help him to be encouraged. He could have been very disappointed at this time. Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness of me in Rome. Two key words. Testify in Jerusalem and bear witness. Right? They're different. A testification or testify versus being a witness. And a testify which he's doing now and five times in Jerusalem and also in Caesarea, he's going to testify, not witness. The difference is he's given his own testimony of his personal experience before coming to know Christ when he's doing the opposite and after he came to know Christ. That's our testimony too. Then he gives one significant event is in chapter 22 with a mob. So we each have a testimony, and I challenge you, what is your testimony this morning, before and after? Do we, do we have a clear testimony or, or not? Have we shared it with others? That's the first part of our witness is our testimony. Our witness is our whole lifestyle, but also the, they both apply to the gospel, the good news, the wit testimony, and uh, the witness. We're called to be witnesses, yes, but that isn't just the gospel. It's our whole lifestyle, our conduct, our character. That is our witness. Testimony is more limited to our personal testimony, and I challenge you to have a, a, a what do you say, elevator testimony. 30 seconds, how do I witness somebody I only meet, not witness or testify, or a one minute, three minute, five minute, 30 minute. I've never shared my testimony with this church, but maybe someday I will on a Wednesday night. We'll see, as I'm going through different topics. But we each have a testimony, and that we can share with different people at different times. And Paul's doing it, and he's getting persecuted for it. <laughs> and um, sometimes, as you look through the word testimony, if we have time at the end, I may cover it, the difference, more. Because if you look at that word throughout the book of Acts, it's used about nine times, then witness 12 times, and how it's used in the New Testament. It's usually mixed with something else, the testimony, and, and further. What can I say about verse 12 to 15? The Jews take a vow not to eat or drink, okay, before they kill Paul, 40 of them. And then a young man somehow hears about that and tells Paul, and Paul tells him, tell the captain, who, who does he tell the centurion? Wait, wait, how does it go? The centurion is over 100. And then the centurion went to the captain, the chain of command. And then the captain calls this young man, which I say, what age is this young man? That's Paul's nephew, the only relative of Paul mentioned in the whole Bible. So this young man that he took by the hand, I believe was in his early teens, could have been seventh or eighth grade, but he overheard this. 
and told Paul, which told the centurion, which told the captain. And the captain's decision was, well, first of all, this, the captain, he said uh, to the young man, don't tell nobody else. And he didn't. <laughs> so I, I believe that's a, a wonderful action, but that shows God's protection. This section is God protects us when, it, when we're in his will and his time. Paul knew it wasn't his time to go. He had to go to Rome, at least. So God's protection and his providence, two key words. It doesn't say providence here, but the providence of God is upon each of us as we seek him, and we, we can know it. this is his will. And we see his hand upon us in different ways at different times. Even when as we're getting older, we know, Lord, I think I only have a few years or so left. But, you know, that God kind of gives us an indicator. Paul knew he had some years left. He wasn't going to go to Rome and die there, which we'll cover as we go through future in the book of Acts. The third part, the captain writes a letter to Felix the governor. Paul has an escort on a horse. They didn't... He usually walked everywhere. I mean, this is royalty. The, the military is protecting God's servant, the gospel, through Paul, to continue on in the nation of law and order. It's blessed at this time. Other times, the church has to go underground and not be so open because there's going to be persecution at different times in different places. We don't have it here yet. We can go out and witness in our nation not as Muslim nations, and the providence of God. His time on that individual in that area, the providence of God. Our founding fathers of our nation believed much in the providence, the pilgrims, the Puritans, and everything that branched off from them, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Pres um, different ones. So protection and providence we see over Paul's life. It's written to who? The most excellent governor, Felix. Luke, who is writing this, also says that's why he wrote to Theophilus in Luke chapter 1, verse 3. The most excellent is a title of somebody in a high position. He wasn't flattering him. That was a normal title at that time for that person in the high position, the most excellent governor, Felix. Later on, he calls him noble, most noble. They're the same, except one is when he speaks to him personally, the other is when he writes to him. So they were very educated, they're very literate, the Roman Empire, the people of that time, especially the ones in positions, to, to know what was going on, to understand the laws. What happened when he came back? Let's see. He came to Caesarea. Half of them went back to Jerusalem, and he continued on in the horse. The governor Felix says, I will hear you when your accusers come. So the Sanhedrin, or Ananias, a high priest, is going to come five days later, which leads us to chapter 24, which Raymond will share, how is his witness now in Caesarea before the Roman governor Felix and the Sanhedrin? His testimony continues. Now I have a little bit of time for questions over chapter 23. Yes, Bill? How did they identify Paul? Did he say he was a Roman? How, did they get to just go ahead and believe him, or is there a way to check up on him? He didn't have a driver's license, right? <clears throat> right, well, he used to be with the Sanhedrin, or the, that group, very tightly but when he was persecuting the Christians. And they knew he was from Tarsus, which is a city in Cilicia, the region. So he verified maybe he wasn't leader, um, this Roman governor over Caesarea. 
he verified that, yes, this is the same person with others that did know him. This is the same Paul that used to persecute the church. Now he's going to the Gentiles and bringing the gospel. So recognition we'd see. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why I didn't address them as fathers, because he was, he addressed them, he knew their, their duties and responsibilities and their religion very well, because he used to be the, of Gamaliel, the highest known teacher of the Pharisees, he was taught under him. So they all know each other, even though it was how many years later, about 23 years later. 23 years has happened since he was in Acts 9. He goes through the three mission journeys, and, and now he's where he said he was going to be at the first place, back in Jerusalem before he goes to Rome, being a witness to the Gentiles. When did Paul first learn he was going to be that witness? Is back in Acts 19.23, where he said the Spirit showed him. Even before the prophets and other people in Ephesus said, don't go to Jerusalem, you're going to be harmed there. No, no, the Holy Spirit let him know ahead of time. Then the others were just confirming what the Holy Spirit already showed Paul. Any other questions? On a Wednesday night, I hope to, uh, as we're addressing the angels in different what I call doctrines of the faith. Uh, I'm going to discuss being a witness some Wednesday nights and, and different things. I don't know where, where it will lead, but I encourage you to, uh, as a pastor and I teach on Wednesdays, that you come and uh, participate, or if you can't, for some reason, you listen in on YouTube. And even in Sunday school, that is uh, more that come, you know, we're, we're working, we're praying for everyone that comes. It would be more of a blessing as part of this church that you, uh, just that we're, we're more united in the way that, uh, more like the book of Acts. The book of Acts is really a good book that tells how the church should be, and we want to be like it in the right way. Amen? Amen. Yes, Phil? Um, I'm just kind of curious how the, San, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, they had rules and laws about people's you know, due process and all that. Mm -hmm. But whenever those men bonded together to kill Paul, they didn't even give it a second thought. They just said yes. No, Phil says it's uh, why, interesting how they bonded together all of a sudden when they were, they were, this is the way it works. <laughs> when the truth of Jesus Christ comes, those that used to be divided and they're presented with challenge their income, their money, challenge their power, their base of authority in religion or, or government, and what used to be enemies will unite against Christ because they're all following the world system. Yes, they disregarded their own laws so they could um, persecute the Apostle Paul. And they go after the leaders in the church. That's how they go after the pastors first to cut them off when the government does or the religious system says, we can't have this. They're too one way. Anyway, it can lead to God. No. <laughs> we're, we're, we are narrow-minded <laughs> as far as one way. Yes. Who was it I was speaking with? This, uh, um, yeah, yes. It was in a coffee shop, and this, they had a Baha'i convention. I don't know if you heard of the Baha'is, but they believe all the religions are coming together, and they're the leaders that are going to unite the world under a world religion, and uh, they, they really promote, they have a system to promote their beliefs, their belief system. And, and I have to say, when I heard them and listening, talking with them, 
you know, I'm, I'm very narrow-minded. I believe Jesus Christ is the only way. And uh, <laughs> I didn't have much time to speak with him, so I just gave a short testimony there. And I should have done more as I look back. <laughs> Because there's also a young man that's going to college studying philosophy and it was at the table as we were four talking and met each other real quick. I was ready to leave. But, you know, always be ready with the, the testimony. Preach the word instant, in season, out season, but have your personal testimony. Write it down if you have to. Be ready to share it. And see if the Lord, the Holy Spirit, opened the door that you give your personal testimony. If you have one, that's clear that um, this week, or, or really any time. We don't want to rush it and say, oh, we have to be fanatics and witness with everybody all the time. No. There's a time. There's a timing. And we can have a peace. And if we are persecuted, we'll have joy. We don't say, we don't do it wrong. We do it filled with the Holy Spirit, led of the Holy Spirit. And then we have a peace when we do, do it. And if we don't, we feel a conviction of the Holy Spirit. I should have witnessed with that person, testified before him. That's the way it works. Amen? Amen. All right. So God bless, and I'll pray for the, the service coming up. Pray with me. <clears throat> Lord God, we do thank and praise you for your goodness, your grace that we can know you, your mercies that... We know it's upon the whole world, but for some reason we're benefactors of it. We benefit from it. We can live the new life in Christ. And more and more, as we see the day approaching of his return, we pray for this Father's Day. Help us be men of God, fathers, parents, in the working community where we work and labor to your glory, in our, where we live here and now, Look into the future. Guide the rest of this service in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Good morning, Fellowship Church. We're going to sing everybody in with this song. Although there's sunshine outside, we're going to sing Showers of Blessing. Please stand with us. Has somebody uh, seen Brony Heath? Brony, Colin, Brony. All right, we'll sing it then. Uh, intro. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, send them upon us, O oh Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing, come and now honor thy word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, oh that today they might fall. Blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, even with trust and obey. There shall be seasons we pressing, if we let God have his way. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. One more time. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Brother Marv. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? All right, let's pray for these people on our prayer list. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. I thank you for friends and loved ones that are here, church family, those that are watching by YouTube. We pray your blessings on each one here today. Lord, we pray for Timothy Townsend, for Myra's Aunt Shirley and the Pickerel and Hawkins families. Matthew Knight, Eric and Isabella, uh, John, uh, Wayne, uh, John and Wayneley, Kathy and Bob uh, A, also for Garnett Anderson, Georgetta Bonds uh, and her, her son, Cheryl and Angelo, Christina uh, Larkin and her husband uh, Robert, Melissa Seacrest, 
Michael Turley, uh, Chloe Saul, also for Ken and Lorraine, Ella Mason and Evan, for Michelle Waddell, Betty Stepp, covering from COVID, David Proctor, Kimberly Harris, I mentioned to you last week, doing so well. And her father, who had two heart attacks, Chuck Harris, a lot of you know him, uh, and two uh, strokes and a heart attack, he's doing very well. God has answered prayer. Uh, Jim Heath, Paul Fitchner, Linda Mendora, Ashley Enstrom and her son, uh, Kristen Stockman, also for Jerry Muchow, uh, also for Joey and Mary, Tommy Harrison and his family, Antonio Lyle, I understand doing much better, Diane McNeil, also for uh, Maria Jones, also for David Beam, Joan Hall's son, David Hall, Demetrius here today, praise God, from the Jude House, uh, also for Larissa, uh, the Kacheski family, Charles and the Newman family, also for Dory Hardesty, uh, Stephen Roberts, also for Ginger, A.J. Konigan and family, Harry and Roxanne Burgers, Mike Winston, also Dale Hayes, the Malberg family. Uh, um, Andy had that operation and he's recuperating. Rose Younger praying for her. Uh, Sherry Greenhow, also for Valerie Jorgensen, and back in England. Uh, Jim Garner, Zoe Strong, Shana Reason, uh, Contina Mattingly and her husband Paul, we love them, miss them. Joseph and Kelly and family. Joseph, is he out of the hospital? Praise God, through a very difficult time. Uh, Becky Cheney, also, uh, she's doing very well also. Marissa Crown, also for Maria O'Connor, the Eisenhart family. Uh, Aaron uh, Bell's uh, daughter, Arona, I, I know he's here somewhere. Praise God. Also for um, Bruce Harris, my cousin right here. Are you doing all right? Hey, and he, he turns 62 tomorrow, Miss Debbie. 62 tomorrow. Dave DeMar, doing very well in Florida. Jean Mathiel, also for Greg Gibson. Uh, also recuperating, Cheryl uh, uh, Farrar, my daughter. Paul Mattingly, Adrian Coppold, I understand, is doing very well. Um, Dory Hardesty, Donna's sister, Vivian Martinio, Crystal, good to see Crystal here today. My wife Donna doing jumping jacks, she's doing much better with her shoulder. Oakley Miller, Jonathan Youngson, uh, Chuck McClanahan, Kathy Saw, Trish Colleen, and um, also remembering um, the flowers, by the way, in the front and on the back table. Beautiful arrangements were from yesterday for the homegoing of uh, our dear, sweet friend, uh, Ruth. Uh, we're going to miss her very much, but she's having a time today. Also, remembering Nancy Willis and uh, the family of Ron Klein, who used to go here before he moved to uh, Virginia. Uh, he passed away this past week praying for that family. Also on our prayer list for our military, Tim Harmon, Israel E. Remo, Ashley Baldo, Anita Baldo, I'm sorry, Anthony Baldo, Char Charlie Burke, and Brandon Hardesty. Lord, we pray for these people. We pray your blessings on them, and we look forward to uh, hearing a praise reports in the near future. In your name, Lord Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Brother Ray. Thank you, you Pastor eat? Marvin. You ate quite a bit yesterday, didn't you? I what? You ate quite a bit. Yes, I did. <laughs> Stand with us, please. Good morning, Fellowship Church. The only name. Yours will be the only name that matters to me. The only one whose favor I seek 
the only name that matters to me. Yours will be the friendship and affection I need to feel my father smiling on me. The only name that matters to me. And yours is the name, the name that saved me. Mercy and praise the Father forgave me. And your love is all I ever needed. Yours will be the only name that matters to me. The only one whose favor I see. The only name that matters to me. Yours will be the friendship and affection I need to feel my father smiling on me. The only name that matters to me. And yours is the name, the name that saved me. Mercy and praise and power forgave me. And your love is all I ever needed. I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story morning that the singer uh, of this song, Big Daddy, just passed away, right, Ronnie? Oh, yeah. So, oh. so I could just imagine him waking up in glory and seeing the face of Jesus Christ. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes. 
to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. I praise you, Lord, for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. I burn with shame. Grant my desire to magnify Your name. Lord, take my life and make it holy Thine. thank you lord for this new day that you have given us we thank you that we have our heavenly father that we can call any time of the day and your ears are always open to our cry lord we thank you for allowing us to be here again in your house to praise you glorify your name and to listen to your word to worship you and we plead for the blood of Jesus Christ once again to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and sin. And from your throne of heaven, Lord, we believe that you hear us and you're looking down upon us today. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to move and touch our hearts once again. Speak to us through your servant and may your word bear its fruit in our lives. As we ask these in Jesus' name, amen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Open our eyes. 
an overachiever here on the end. He's already in. (laughs) 
You can have more than one. You can put your hand up when you have your gum ready for the bubble. <laughs> you do look as funny as you think you do. <laughs> Vacation joke. <laughs> Are you ready? You look ready? No, no, not yet. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> You can practice. You can practice if you want. <laughs> You're going to judge. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Anybody else want to blow before we get go? Uh -oh. Mark had talent, didn't I, Candace? I told you. <laughs> Look, Mr. Serious here on the end. <laughs> Come on, Randy, you can do it. Oh, oh, okay. oh, oh. Come on, Dave, that's it. You better get enough beat. Everybody ready? Uh -uh. Are we ready? Yep. No? Everybody ready? I thought we were already ready. No, we're, we're going to do one, two, three. <laughs> ready? Set. Blow number one. Judges, are you paying close attention? <laughs> Oh, we, we had hidden talent there. All right, judges, are you ready for blow number two? All right, gentlemen, ready, set, go. Judges, did you get that? Okay. All right. Do you need a meeting? Okay. A meeting of the minds? A meeting of the minds? Okay. Judges, for the final blow. Gentlemen, are you ready? Set. Go. Come on, Randy. You get the ball. Oh. Come on, Randy. Uh oh. This one. It must be wearing out that thing. Come on, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can you give me number one, two, and three, and four? One, two, three, four, five. You want to write them down here, you guys? Okay, you want to put them right here? All right. One, first place, second, third place. Okay. 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 Good deal. All right. Thank you very much, judges. If you would like to stay and put, uh, oh, give the awards out, we'll be ready. Our first place winner. Oh, we're not gonna do first place first. But our needs more practice goes to Randy Collins. Yes, yes, yes. 
Our next is for participating with a good attitude. That goes to Mr. Phil. Here, Miss uh, Remo is gonna. She's gonna show you up. All right, good job. Thank you so much for being such good sports and how, allowing us to enjoy Father's Day today. So, anybody else need some gum? You know what Mark Crawford does all the, at those tournaments, don't you? Jeremy, I think you need some. Uh, uh, Mr. Bill, there you go. Huh? All right, we're gonna start with. Uh, um, all right. No, we're not. We're not doing. Uh, we're not doing prizes yet. Yeah, we're not doing prizes yet. At this time, we're going to get a little bit serious. And um, Mr. Chad has volunteered, or was it kind of full, volunteered or voluntold? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chad's going to come up and he's talk about a good father. So um, be kind and let's listen real close for Mr. Chad. Make sure we hear you. <laughs> I don't put this thing on. It's on. It's already on. Okay. Thank you, okay. Oh, what love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. We can't hear you, brother. Oh. <laughs> I said all of that. <laughs> so let me. Can you hear him now? Can I just cook this? Yep. Okay. Nice. I said, uh, what love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. So uh, the perfect Father, I want to give honor to first. And then I would just want to say a uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Amen. Uh, th this is a track that uh, Debbie uh, Vallon told me. <laughs> <laughs> and I thank her for that, breaking me out of my comfort zone of that nice little seat over there. <laughs> And this is a good father. These are 14 attributes of a good father. A good father is known by the Lord. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Genesis 18, 19. A good father serves the Lord. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom ye will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. A good father leads. The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Proverbs 27. A good father nurtures. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4. A good father protects, and the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Proverbs 14, 14 26. A good father provides. What man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, he will give him a stone. Or if he asks a fish, will give him a serpent. If ye then, being evil, know how to 
give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Matthew 7, 19 through 11. A good father comforts. Ye know how to, you know how we exhorted and comfort, comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. First Thessalonians 2, 11. A good father understands. As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Psalm 103, 13. A good father teaches these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest, risest up. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. A good father prepares. Train up your children in the way he should go, and, he, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. A good father disciplines. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, correcteth, even as a father, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. And these are the last three. A good father forgives. He arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fattest calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Luke 15, 20 through 24. A good father rejoices. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. 3 John 1, verse 4. And a good father is blessed. Children are an inheritance, inherited, uh, children are an, uh, an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of, the mighty, of a mighty man, so are children of, youth, of, the, of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Psalm 127, 3 through 5. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank Appreciate you. it, Thank brother. you for thinking of me. Thank you. Mr. Ray is going to uh, he's going to sing a song for Father's Day for us. Thank you, Mr. Chad. Appreciate that. Pilgrims on the journey of the narrow road, and those who've gone before us line the way, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives a stirring testament. To God's sustaining grace Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses Let us run the race not only for 
for the prize. But as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. After all the hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all we've left behind. May the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful may the fire of our devotion light their way may the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey oh may all who come behind us find us faithful oh may all who come behind us find us faithful may the fire of our devotion light their way may the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful, faithful, faithful. Mr. Ray, thank you very much. Appreciate that great song. All right, this time we're going to recognize our uh, dad that has the oldest child present today. Our dad that has the oldest child present today. So who has a child here, and they're the oldest? Trish, how old is your child? Let's just put a range. Okay, we got Candace. Roy said he, she's old. Pay him back, pay him back. <laughs> All right, anybody have any child here older than Candace? All right, I see Lori already hiding. Okay, how about Joe? Uh, Joe, you have someone older than Lori? Okay, you, how old are you, Chris? Can you beat that, Lori? <laughs> Okay, so Mr. Uh, Headings uh, gets that. Merle Headings, give him a hand. All right. So the dad with the youngest child present. Anybody beat two? Anybody younger than two? Present. They have to be here today. The baby's here too. Oh. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> Let's take a vote. Does it count if the mama's still carrying it? Yes. All right, come on down. <laughs> you are overachiever. That's right. 
All right, the dad with the most kids in church today. The dad with the most kids in church today. How many has more than five? More than four? Four? Yeah. How many? Yeah, they have to be here today. All right, how many? Anybody have more than four? Well, who had the other kid under two? They're, they're not here, though. They're not here. Yeah. All right, Mark, come on down. <laughs> We're going to do the raffles now. Candace, Mark made us do that. Father of the year. Father of the year. I mean, she deserves it more than that. Aw. Look how he's making up real quick. That's right. That's good. <laughs> Mama ain't the boss, right? <laughs> All right, good deal. All right, we're going to start off with our raffles. Are you doing that or these? Oh, we're going to do flowers. Ah, flowers. Okay, we got a bunch of good stuff today. All right, men, you have your tickets. All right, our first ticket goes to 162. 162. Right there, Mr. Jerry. Good job, 162. Our next one goes to 182. 182. There we go, Mr. John. Oh, wow. Oh, any of that. All, right. All right. Our first dad giveaway is a barbecue set. It is 179. 179. There we go, Oscar. 179. All right. Our next one is a car care kit. 146. 146. There we go, Mr. Chad. He earned his today. <laughs> Next is a cooler. All right. 176. 176. 176. 176. Go on what? Huh? Okay. We'll, we'll skip over. Next one? It's the same, but uh, cooler goes to ticket 193. One nine three. There we go. There we go. Good job. One nine three. All right. And this is a light up cornhole game. A light up cornhole game. Goes and you can invite me over because I'm a ring. That's all right. That's not true. <laughs> Don, I'm sorry. <laughs> she told on lying this morning. Huh? One nine seven. 197. There we go. We have a winner. 197. That's right. Ugly stick. Okay, we have an ugly stick, a fishing pole, and if Wayne gets it, I know it was set up. Ready? 210. 210 for the fishing pole. In the back, Mr. Scott. All right. All right, now we're moving on to our gift cards. Thank you, Christian and Juliana, for our runners today. All right, our first one is $25 gift card to Longhorn. All right, every, every guy likes steak, right? All right, 191 is our, there we go, Justin. 191. Our next one is a $25 Texas Roadhouse card. 178, 178, 178. Mr. Andy. And our next one is an Outback $25 gift card. 218. 218. 218. 218. Going once. Going twice. All right, we're going on. Moving on. All right. Going to Outback. 129. 129. There we go. Okay, one, two, nine. Okay, our $50 Wild Wild gift card goes to drum roll. One, eight, seven. One, eight, seven. There we go, Danny McKinney. Happy Father's Day.
சொல்லிட்டு சார் Let's stand and we're going to sing Our God Reigns. We're just singing the first and the second verse of this song. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of Him who brings good news. Good news announcing peace proclaiming news of happiness our god reigns 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 Our God reigns, He had no stately form, He had no majesty, that we should be drawn to Him. He was His mind, and we took no account of Him, yet now He reigns. With our most high, our God reigns, 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 our God reigns. Our God reigns. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, a lot of action going on here today, huh? Bubblegum. All right. That was a blessing. Do you mind if I give you a testimony today? No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Aaron uh, has an amazing testimony. Um, come on up here. Uh, I don't mean to embarrass you. I just want you to. We were talking yesterday at the Jude House. And he mentioned, he said, Pastor, the story you just told is me. He said, I had from seventh grade to twelfth. Yeah. What was your average grade? All Fs. All Fs. Wow. But you could play what, baseball? Baseball. I got drafted to the Montreal Expos in 1986. Mm -hmm. But I got hurt and uh, that ended my career. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell about signing the three contracts. Uh, you got three contracts when you get drafted. It's your bonus contract, your original contract, and your contract for the rules. So when I got drafted and went on stage, and they take you backstage, uh, the guy said, uh, Mr. Bell said, here's, here's the contracts. And I had the contracts upside down. He said, uh, the, he said your contract is upside down. And I played it off like that uh, I was joking but I couldn't read or write. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, they pushed me through school because of my sports athletics. And uh, I went from the seventh grade to the 12th grade with all less. Uh, so when I got hurt and it ended my career, I was pretty much stuck. I can remember me and my friends uh, going to McDonald's and I might wanted a cheeseburger, but they might order a number one combo and uh, I said, well, give me the number one combo. But I didn't want no number one combo. <laughs> but I couldn't read or write to say that I wanted a double cheeseburger, you know. And uh, uh, God came in my life and uh, 
I began to get serious about it because I couldn't get no job or nothing. I couldn't even get licensed because I couldn't read. And so I picked up the Bible and uh, I began to learn how to read through the Bible. And that's how I began how to read through the Bible. And uh, that started my, my reading career off, you know. And uh, for a long time, I was ashamed to tell, tell anybody that uh, because of my sports ass living. I didn't have to read or write. The only thing I had to do is show up in school and uh, mm -hmm. uh, play sports. And, and they pushed me right through. So when I got hurt, uh, I couldn't get a job. I couldn't do nothing. So I took up roofing. And uh, roofing deal with a lot of numbers. And I became pretty good at roofing. But uh, I picked up my Bible and asked God to uh, please teach me how to read because I had my daughters, and I can remember them saying, uh, Dad, uh, uh, read this book to me. And I would throw it off. I said, my eyes hurt. I said, uh, tell your mom to read it, you know, and stuff like that. So I began to pick up my Bible and read my Bible. And God blessed me that I could, you know, that I could read and uh, go get a job. I'm still not the best reader, but I do know what a hamburger is. <laughs> 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 That's a great testimony, amen? amen? Praise God. Today, Father's Day, I want us to look at Eliakim, man of steel and velvet. And come on up here, uh, Bruce, you got to open us in prayer. That's my cousin. Good morning. Bruce Harris. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, every eye closed and every head bowed down. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we come to you on this Father's Day. We thank you, Father God, for allowing us to see this day. Most people don't see this day, so we are truly blessed in the name of Jesus only. Father God, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to see this day, and tomorrow is my birthday. At 62 years old, if you allow me to see, is a truly blessing. Many people don't live to see 62, but I want to thank you as I live in Christ Jesus, that I'm like Apostle Paul, for to live is for Christ, for to die is to gain. Father God, thank you for each and every one here, each and every man here. The Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother, thy days shall be lengthened. I just want to say thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Isaiah 22, starting with verse 20. Uh, and we see the confidence and the strength that God's word gives us, like the testimony we just heard. Uh, and it shall come to pass that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. And he shall open, and none shall shut. And he shall shut, and none will open. And we go on to read in verse 23. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to my father's house. In a time when our nation... Uh, Unlike any other time in history of our country, we certainly need some men of God to take a stand. Amen? Amen. There has been an intense effort over the last three decades by Hollywood, social media, uh, and different organizations to demasculinize the men of our country or to paint them as villains. When I think of that, I think of Ben Carson, one of our heroes. Uh, who they criticized him, and, and he was our former housing and uh, urban development uh, person. Uh, it was cruel, the things that were said about him. Uh, such a man of God. I'll tell you a story about uh, Ben Carson. I used to work in Baltimore at a radio station, WWIN. And uh, he, on his way to work, he worked at John Hopkins. Um, pulled into the gas station in his uh, Jaguar and got out to get gas and he went inside to pay for it. 
and two thieves jumped in his Jaguar and took off. And when they were leaving the parking lot, they looked back and realized it was Ben Carson. And they stopped. And they turned around and went back and said, we're sorry, Mr. Carson, and gave him his keys back. <laughs> man, that's, that's a man of God right there. Can I get an amen? Listen, the role of the father is mocked by television programs. <laughs> As dads are made to look like bumbling fools. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this is totally opposite of what we used to watch. How many people in here are old enough to remember Bonanza? Three of you. How about um, Leave it to Beaver? Uh, make room for daddy. Father knows best. Ozzy and Harriet, where the father in the home was wise and a loving leader. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Morality produces stability and respect for others. Immorality produces perverseness, creates chaos, confusion, Fear, disease, and death. An example of that was not long ago, Jerry Brown of California, the governor, signed the transgender bill. I can't believe it was 2013. That it, it said that it was legal for boys who believe that they are girls to dress and shower in the girls' locker room. Use the restrooms because they claim they are girls. And girls can do the same thing in the boys' locker rooms and use the boys' restrooms because they say they are boys. How crazy is that? That doesn't line up with the Word of God, does it? Uh, how sinful, how wicked. Can I get an amen? God has given to us in His Word moral boundaries to strengthen society and family and not tear it down. Isn't it nice and refreshing to see men who are men and not ashamed to be men? Uh, and they act like men. Uh, and they look like men. And they provide like men. Men who have balance in their lives. And women uh, who are God-fearing, no doubt. Listen up. I'm talking about men who have the strength of steel in their character and the velvet of gentleness and kindness in their souls. Men who know how to be strong and responsible and also how to be tender and considerate. When it comes to marriage, Paul said in Ephesians 5, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their husbands in everything. In verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. We need to be lovable. Amen? Amen. I like this verse. There's a lot of deep, the, all the Bible is deep. But this verse touches me. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. That's good, isn't it? 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Give honor to your wife as unto the weaker vessel. Vessel. That's another blessing. Give honor to your wife. And as being heirs together by the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. I'm 76. And you know what I've learned this past year? I get my wife in on everything I can. When I pray, I want her praying with me. I haven't been like that in the past, but I will tell you, we've seen God do some amazing things and answers to prayer. Here in Isaiah 22, we meet Eliakim, a type of Christ. His name means, my God will rise up. His name points to Jesus rising from the dead. Eliakim has a servant's attitude. God called him my servant. There are just a few in Scripture God referred to as my servant. 
Abraham, Moses, Caleb, David, Job. Question, what are the traits of the heart of the one who is a servant for the Lord? Point number one, he respects and rejoices in the Lord. Psalm 2.11 says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. God's servant has a reverent fear for the Lord. He rejoices in his love. He respects God's holiness. When I look back over the years here, for examples, there are many examples of God's wonderful men. I think of one uh, in the back, on the back wall we have a plaque uh, for Stan Gaines, a man of God. He was tough. He was a warrior. But he was also tender and precious and caring. No doubt a praying man of God. I'll never forget the times we would pray. Uh, he no doubt taught many of us how to pray. And he uh, did not pray two or three minutes. We would pray, and when we would finish, like we would go to Bob Evans, when we would finish, Bill, nobody was there. Everybody had left but him. He was amazing, but he loved people. And you know what? This is embarrassing to say this. He could name all of my great-grandkids, my grandkids, faster than I could. <laughs> Am I right? Those of you that know Stan Gaines. Amen. And we're looking forward to seeing him again. Moving on. Point number two. We see the man of God respects and rejoices in the Lord. And we have a lot to rejoice about. This past week, um, my cousin Chuck Harris, who did the electrical work here for years, uh, was in the hospital. He had over a gallon, I don't even know that this is possible, over a gallon of water in his lungs, wow. fluid. He had two strokes and a heart attack. And that was last week, a week about a week and a half ago. He's back at home. He said, Marvin, I feel great. I'm going in for some tests later on in this coming week. But everybody prayed, and it was just a miracle how he totally uh, got his strength back and, and, uh, and uh, doing great in one week. Listen, the man of God or the man of steel and velvet is resolute. Uh, he has made up his mind to live for the Lord, and the Lord is his focus. The servant gives himself to the Lord like Joshua. And he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Isaiah 22, 23 says of Eliakim that the Lord said and will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. Back in the days that homes would be constructed, they would build nails into the walls for strength, unmovable. And we read in Acts 5, when Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's taking a stand. Amen? Amen. Uh, you know, the, the verse that took me out of the body and fender business, I like to quote often. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your work or your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What a great verse. That verse got me out of the body shop because I felt like the work that I was doing, body and fender work, was good, but it wouldn't last for eternity. And uh, so uh, um, here I am, and here you are listening to me. That's a double blessing. I tell people, they say, your church is a nice size. I say, well, you know why? The people feel sorry for me, and they come back every week to pray for me. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? That was weak. Wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> Point number three, the servant has regard for others. Wow, if we could learn this. You find God doesn't come. Listen, this is real important. Are you all listening to me? Yeah. This is real important. You find God doesn't comfort his people 
to make them comfortable, but to make them comforters. Isn't that a blessing? He wants us to be comforters, to encourage people. Many Christians make a mistake by going to church to get something out of it. The purpose of church is to put something into it. In other words, invest your lives in the lives of others. Isaiah 50, verse 4, And the Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should show how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Oh my, we can encourage people with the word of God. It works. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. I like that. Verse six, chapter 16, verse 15 of 1 Corinthians. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you know the house of Stephanias and the first, fruit, first fruits of Arcadia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. The word addicted is from the Greek word, which means to appoint oneself to a position of responsibility. We should employ our passions in the service of others. Tell your neighbor, I'm addicted. Hey, Amen. Hey, these men had an addiction problem to the ministry of the saints. Are you all with me? All right. Now you all laughing. I forgot what I was going to tell you. All right. Proverbs 25, 13. This is another great verse. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that sent him. For he refresheth the soul of his masters. When I listen to that verse, as the cold of snow in harvest time, harvest time it's hot. Does anybody remember the hot days we had this past week? 95, I think. It was hot. You know, I think of that, but imagine the man of God would be cool and refreshing. It's like working in the summertime, 100 degrees, and you go to the 7-Eleven for a Slurpee. And what happens? You get a brain freeze. Anybody ever had that? Man, that is refreshing. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Listen, having a regard for others. I love the story. Do we have any golfers in here? Andy. All right. I know Andy's a golfer. Any golfer wannabes in here? All right. Right here. Anybody else? Where's Roy? <laughs> Professional golfer Tommy Bolt was playing in Los Angeles. And he had a caddy with a reputation of a constant chatterer. Before they tee off, Bolt told him, don't say one word to me. If I ask you something, you answer yes or no. During the round, Bolt found the ball next to a tree where he had to hit under a branch, over a lake, and onto the putting green. He got down on his knees and he looked through the trees and sized up the shot. I've seen Joe uh, White make a few of these shots, but not Roy. But anyway, <laughs> what do you think, he asked the caddy. Five iron? No, Mr. Bolt, the caddy said. What do you mean no five iron? Bolt snorted. Watch this shot. The caddy rolls his eyes and says, no, Mr. Bolt. But Bolt hit the ball, and the ball stopped two foot from the hole. He turned to his caddy, handed him the fire, fire iron, and said, Now what do you think about that? You can talk now. Mr. Bolt, the caddy said, That wasn't your ball. <laughs> the caddy had respect and obeyed the man. The man of God has respect and regard for others, even if they are wrong sometimes. Eliakim's character reminds us of Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
not our might, his. 1 Peter 5, 10 says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. The last point, the servant or man of God has spiritual eyes. In the word of God, believers are compared to animals often, lions, sheep, eagles. 34 times God talks about eagles. Isaiah says, we shall mount up with wings as eagles. Airplane pilots have seen eagles flying at 15,000 feet, above the storms often. Eagles have their natural eye and a second eye, a clear eyelid membrane, so they can see in storms and strong wind thermals. We Christians also have two eyes. Our normal eyes uh, to see the natural world and the second eyes of the Spirit of God. Since the Holy Spirit is living on the inside, we have His eyes available to see life situations from God's perspective. Uh, John 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, boy, I do like that word Comforter, uh, which is the Holy Ghost. He's called the Comforter. He gives us comfort. He gives us peace. Whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you in all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Our spiritual eyes help us to gain wisdom and discernment. They enable us to see true and false, wise and wicked. Remember Elijah, uh, his servant, I woke up and he looked and he realized they were surrounded totally by the enemy. And he said, Master, what shall we do? And I, I love the next verse. Elijah uh, prayed. And he said, Lord, open the eyes of your servant. And God did, and the servant saw the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire, more than in number of all the others. Imagine that. He didn't think, he thought it was over. Joseph had spiritual eyes. Listen as he talks to his brothers in Genesis 20 verse 50 verse 20. You thought evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save, save much people alive. That's God's uh, Romans 8 28 of the Old Testament. Peter had spiritual eyes. He said that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. God is looking for some men of steel, having strength, uncompromising, covered with velvet or soft-spoken, kind, caring, dying to self. I spoke to a man on Thursday and I told him he was growing in the Lord. I said, you got to die to self. Because there's so many things that will tear us down. You just have to forget it and die to self. Can I get an amen? amen? I've said this a thousand times. If you go to a funeral and there's somebody in a casket and you can say, you're ugly. He don't care. <laughs> Am I right? You can say, I don't like you. He don't care. You know why? Because he's dead. The body's dead. So what I'm telling you is, we need to die to self while we're here on earth. And I'm telling you, people may say the craziest things to you, and half of them may not know what they're saying to you, but just let it roll off your back. Amen? What's more important? God says, one soul is worth more than the whole world. One soul. So when you're talking to somebody, you have respect and you realize that God knows what he's doing. And God is looking for men. Uh, men that uh, are strong, uncompromising. Uh, living for others. 
sold out for the Lord. Remember that old saying, joy is Jesus, others, and yourself, third. Eliakim is a great challenge for us today, here on Father's Day. I want to say thank you to the church, thank you to the men that are here, and uh, the blessing, the joy. At a funeral yesterday, Nancy, uh, Nancy is such a blessing. I want to tell you about her. She had a table with about five or six ladies, and she was preaching to them. And I had to sit down beside her to make sure she was on target. I'm just kidding. You. <laughs> but uh, the lady said, this is the friendliest church. We had several of our people there. And one lady said, you know, my church is not that friendly. And... Uh, and uh, I told them all the jokes I tell you all every week. I mean, I just, I had a list. I just went over all these jokes. And they were really glad when I left. But, uh, <laughs> but that was, Nancy was a real blessing. And that was such a wonderful lady, woman of God. Those flowers on the back are from Ruth's funeral. Be sure to look at them. And um, we just had so many blessings yesterday. Some people asked Jesus to forgive them and save them. That was a blessing. And uh, I want to just say happy Father's Day to you men. And thank you mothers for taking care of your men to make them happy on happy Father's Day. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Hey, wait a minute. Where's Olivia? Is she here today? Come up here, Olivia. She's going to preach the next hour and a half. I'm just kidding you. If you've been encouraged by God's word this morning, would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that here? Amen. Amen. Uh, how many were encouraged over the bubble gum? Uh, that was good, wasn't it? Um, we're um, going to close in prayer, but I wanted her, such a wonderful lady of God, just to tell, she, you're running for office, right? Yes. Um, Stay right here. Is it good afternoon now or good morning? <laughs> it's good afternoon, everyone, and happy Father's Day to all the fathers right now. My name is Olivia D. Rolamus, and I'm running for a school board on District 2, because I live in District 2. I'm a school teacher. I retired in Fairfax County Public School, and I've been an educator for 31 years. And as a board of educator, if I will win, this is my first time, and I salute um, Mark Wurzmark, <laughs> because it's been twice been elected. We have awesome people, educators here in our church. So if you remember, if you live in District 2, remember Olivia D. Rolamas for Board of Education. Amen. And I'm thankful also for Miss Glenda Verley. She is my wonderful treasurer. Amen. Yes. Amen. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you, Pastor. Oh, you're Pastor, welcome. For being, giving Amen. me a chance to talk. All right. Praise <laughs> God. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. 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 All right, um, I'm going to, we're going to close in prayer. Uh, uh, come on up a minute, uh, Chris. Um, I want to mention to you that uh, uh, next week, we may have a visitor coming to speak. I'll let you know uh, maybe Wednesday. But uh, Chris, how about closing us in a word of prayer? If you need any kind of prayer, I would encourage you to come forward. If, uh, if you need to be saved and you're not sure of your salvation, I would encourage you to come forward. Whatever your need might be, uh, after uh, Ray sings and the choir sings this hymn of invitation, then I'm going to have uh, Chris you close us in a word of prayer. All to Jesus I surrender. 
All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender Blessed Savior, I surrender all. Amen. Thank you, choir. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you once again for waking us up this morning on this Father's Day. We just ask, Lord God, that you just continue to strengthen us, Lord God, that we may be the fathers that break the cycles, Lord God. That our lineage, Lord God, will continue to depend on you, Lord God. Continue to raise up willing men, Lord God, that will be willing vessels for you, that will be used by you, Lord God. That when you call on our name, Lord, we will answer, Lord. We just thank you for the mothers. We thank you for the children. We thank you for everybody that made it here safely, Lord God. Lord, and we just ask that you could just continue, Lord God, to direct our path, Lord God, that we would not lean to our own understanding, but in all our ways we will acknowledge you. For we love and we praise you in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. I want you all to do this one more favorite for me. Aaron, I want you to stand back at the door, and I want everybody to shake his hand on the way out. He's got quite a story. Amen.